that that is where i mean by definition the people who uh people in power listen to largely get their information from that source um and so the dominant narrative of ukraine is actually i think the dominant belief system which is um driving the opinion that the people listen to i you you probably don't remember but there was a famous quote from the guy that ran circo in the guardian about six or seven years ago it was the, the headline was something like the biggest company you've never heard of and the guy said oh i don't really you know we don't really mind that people haven't heard of us we, but but we are quite pleased when they do but the people the people who do know about us the five thousand people in the world who actually count you know rest assured we make sure that they know what we're up to um and that that was an article in the gallery i think the, i think the guy's called harris is there a guy called harris writes in the guardian uh, harris yeah northerner yeah i think he wrote it I, I i i might be wrong but i think it was one of his um and it was probably in about 2015 16 17 i mean i, I could find if i looked for it but it's that that this i've had this as an ongoing discussion with with quite a few people that that um um you know elections don't really matter I, it, uh, at, at one level in that um you know you can have as many you know it's the old joke and you have many elections as you like but the government always gets in uh, you know um and and that's truer now than ever so Keir Starmer and um Rishi Sunak they're two technocrats basically um and you know at, at, at quite a deep level neither of them has any democratic legitimacy um you know, I think you could aim that at both of them. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, who do they who do they listen to? Um, well, they listen to people that can affect their position at, in 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 uh, apparent positions of power. And who are those people? Well, it's you know, it's basically uh, financial donors um in 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 a in a way very similar to the way the american system now works um it's, it's, it's so you get these ridiculous narratives like oh um oh the, the labor labor is the party of the unions and they listen to their union paymasters uh, <laughs> uh, when the truth is that both are parties of of um of rich people doing the bidding of you know very wealthy people but the wealthy people that surround and well off that surround those people so i don't uh and 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 within that group of people the dominant belief systems are driven by very orthodox mainstream views um and people you know what you'd call educated people I mean, one of the biggest outliers of the last few years I'm, I'm i'm really not sure if this is true or not but I, i've seen some figures that suggest that the more highly qualified people are the less likely they are to have taken the covid 19 injections right have you I, I, you know I, whether that's true or not i don't know um, I've got to say that on my side, I tend not to ask people um, and people who I know who have been very quiet about it, as in I don't monitor their social media, but the people that I know that have been quiet about it, and obviously if I know them, then they bother to still know me over the years that I've known yeah. them. So they have basically very quietly just not taken it. You know, but not not they've not wanted to present themselves as anti-vaxxers. They've just 
you know, and, and I don't ask them why, but, you know, it's basically just what the fuck is it going to do for me? That's basically why well, they have to. It, it, it is a private matter. Um, uh, and I mean, it, 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 what I find interesting about that is it's kind of counterintuitive to the other point I would make about more educated people being more conventional and more orthodox in their views, which I think is I, I personally think that's something that's become more common. Um you know, with the advent of social media is, you know, the, the, for stepping outside of the party line, you get banished. That's, but, you know, the, but hold on a second. I've got to say this, though. Um, people who are with basically people with more assets that I've come across were so spooked from the beginning. Obviously, I'm not talking about you, but People who are basically, you know, in their 60s, 70s, and all that kind of thing, they were pretty much, most of them, especially the ones with kids, loads of them fucking took it, you know. And, and you know, basically, when the vaccine came, I remember getting emails from a couple of people, who were my friends' parents, and they were, just, they were just like, thank God the vaccine is coming, of course I'll be first in the queue, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, they were just, and these are people who worked in advertising, they know about propaganda. Um, <coughs> yeah. Long, long yeah. Well, so my just just applied to the Ukraine war, which I think is a real it, it is a significant event in our in our time. Yeah. Um. And that anyone would believe that. Um, Russian politicians or British politicians have a particular empathy for what Ukrainian people want or not. You know, it's not about it. Whatever it's about, it isn't about democratic rights of ordinary Ukrainian people. You know, whatever, whatever that is. Well, the other thing uh, that we're being the other piece of bullshit that we're being expected to swallow is that it's about a sovereign nation as well you know so well, say it's got individuals but then afterwards the idea of sovereign nation why can't african countries understand that they need to stick up for the rest of the world against russia in favor of ukraine because it's their sovereignty that's being threatened by this yeah. too it's laughable yeah i mean i i, I uh, above anything the degree to which the the political class or whatever have been able to go for a a, a, a traditional jingoistic type of response I, I i found that quite demoralizing and quite shocking because there are lots of there are lots of other policies that flow from an acceptance of of that response um which are going to con uh, will reinforce the sort of wealth transfer that happened after the global financial crisis and then through in you know which was a continue continued process all, all the way through obviously to the the um uh SARS cov 2 COVID-19 Pan, can you, you know, me, yeah. can you the fact it has all these different names it, it, it is another tell that it, that it's a very thin story. That that yeah. Can you that, give me um, can you give me a couple of examples of uh, the types of wealth transfer techniques that this narrative is aiding? Uh, well, it's. Basically, just putting huge dollops of French freshly minted money into a very small number of hands, mainly yeah. through large multinational corporations um, and, and secondarily through cronyism. 
So the PPE scandals is kind of cronyism, if you like. It's a, it's a lot of money. It's a, it's a lot of money to the to the rest of us. Uh, but in in the in the context of just the sheer amount of freshly minted money, you know, you're talking trillions now. Um, the uh, so 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 with the quantitative easing, uh, the freshly minted money has been placed into the hands of large hedge funds and large corporates. Uh, you know, pharmaceuticals companies, obviously, because they're the ones that have had the, you know, the panacea to cure this terrible plague. Uh, you know, whatever anybody believes about that, um, there's one thing for sure. The profits of pharmaceutical companies certainly didn't suffer and, and, and don't tend to suffer during pandemics. Um, and of course, the, uh, the wealth and uh, an amount of money going to arms manufacturers that certainly doesn't suffer during wars either um so the degree of monopoly and concentration in the economy it it, it it's just there to be seen i mean it, it it's it it and and and, and it's obvious when you look at the figures as well, that that's accelerated through, well, since the global financial crisis. I mean, it's been accelerating since Big Bang. I mean, it's it's a process that's been ongoing since the 1980s, but it, it, it's such a huge process that's gone so far. It's now impossible not to see it. <coughs> and so you just have to look at, um, I, I, I was looking at the figures at the Bank of England yesterday for um, new origination of bonds and stuff like that. I haven't drilled down into it though. I only started looking at the figures yesterday. But but um, we're in the middle of a huge credit cut crunch if one is participating in the real economy. And, you know, if you're not a, a scion of, of, of uh, uh, high finance, and speculative financialized capitalism uh the, the tide's out yeah <laughs> you know that's the thing I, I thought the, the 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 canals um suffering from low tides in venice was actually quite a good metaphor really is that happening now mm. but yeah i mean i i'm i'm very very uh pessimistic of any immediate pressure which will be taken notice of in the corridors of power um, and that's because um, those who are divide, divided and ruled most I think by social media are uh, you know, people in the corridors of power do pay attention to what people say in Twitter, but it's it's so obviously split into two camps. Um, and um, like I say, it. it the top 10 percent of the um financial demographic demographic is really you know um i think the only demographic with a, a, a even a hope of being heard um you know it's a, 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 and the degree of influence peters out pretty quickly i mean you know it's it, uh, yeah it, it's not it just isn't great at the moment i'm afraid and you know I, I mean i'm i'm feeling something of a failure myself in that i've i've kind of thought well i mean i've, I've pulled out of the last big transaction we were trying to do because i've 
really I didn't think we could make any money. It just became clear that that um, it wasn't possible uh, to to get into a deal of that nature at this stage of the cycle and emerge the other end of it with a profit. So it's, hence, there's no point in doing it. Can I, uh, can I just may I may I just say something? Mm. Uh, in my view, um, that does not make you a failure, even though it's normal for you to feel like that, having really put in so many hours, days, weeks, months on the trot. Um, it doesn't make you a failure. It just means that you're able to read the scenario. I know that when I've said that to you before, <laughs> you've said to me, yeah, but <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. But, I mean, I know you know about those cycles, and that's why... It's just very good well, that you didn't go in. You could have got in and fucked up. Well, the, I think the point is, is that um, uh, as things stand right now, um, the opportunities for the consolidation of financial wealth remain in place and that doesn't bode well for a return to the sort of economy that i think ultimately um results in a fairer distribution of wealth you know you know the power and control freaks Although I personally do consider most of them to be absolute fucking idiots. Um, uh, I, <laughs> um, are, are I think they've been bequeathed the system which... Um, is very hard to get off the rails now. I mean, m merely because they are fucking idiots. I mean, uh, the, the, the people who conceived of this certainly weren't fucking idiots. You know, I think they were evil geniuses, as it were. Um, I don't think we're ruled by e e evil geniuses anymore. I, I just think that the evil geniuses that created this system made it absolutely bulletproof, probably even knowing that they're heirs to, to, to their... Their, their plan would turn out to be fucking idiots, inbred idiots sort of thing, you know. Um, that's and, and that's massively alarming. Um, uh, yeah, so. Anyway, come the spring and all the rest of it, I, 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 I you know, um, well, you know, so hopefully it's the darkest hour just before the dawn, but. You know, it's um, uh, th there's the course that we're on has, has kind of stymied my plans in the meantime. Uh, and sure. the I mean, the outlook isn't good for. Um, you know, for first time buyers or for. For, for people in employment, for people out of employment, people that want. You know, pe people that just want to, you know, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. The, the the outlook is just terrible at the moment. To be honest, I've had some news which I, which I wanted to tell you about. I don't know if I'll tell you today, but I wanted to tell you about some news that I've had, which um, is would would go down as bad news under most circumstances. But I've I've been out on an evening with you, and. Uh, I can tell you this, Roger, on an evening with you, there is no such thing as bad news. I've seen you just ignore the bad news and turn what might be bad news into a good night. So, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think that's also part of what you were doing as well, because, you know, when you said in January, all the indicators were flashing red. I think other people might have got out before, but you were thinking, you know what? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. And you've told me before that as an entrepreneur, costs change decisions you know get made on you know what that scenario is right then and all that kind of thing um but yeah i've, I've had some news about where i live uh to do with um 
they have major works on the building. Oh, um, right. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I've been told is the bill's going to be 70 grand. It's likely to be right. 70 grand. And they would want the money. I mean, they haven't told me, but another leaseholder has basically found out that it's 36 grand for a one bedroom flat, probably and 70 grand for a two bedroom flat. Um, so I probably wouldn't be able to find that. And the, but at the same time, because I don't know when it's due, but at the same time, the good thing is, of course, um, Holly moved out recently, by the way. Uh, we're still to, we're still together, but um, she's got her own kind of space. She's renting somewhere. But um, the thing is that um, in a way it's good because since Helena passed away, I've been sort of trying to get back to normal. And mm-hmm. now um, is the best chance that I have of getting on with things because, you know, I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself. And then afterwards, generally getting back into form. And right now I actually feel good about lots of things. So at my age, in terms of what I'm going to do, whatever I'm going to do, now's the time to do it. And if I have to move, I have to move. And if I stay, I stay. But regardless, I do feel good about wherever I'm going to go next. I just don't have it fully planned out um, at all. But um, yeah, so it might on the surface look like insecure, you know. On so, some so who, who's, who's the freeholder where you are? Is, is it the council still or is it in a housing yeah, association? Council. Yeah, no, it's the council. Um, uh so I suppose I could ask them for the. I mean, they haven't given the bill yet. I could ask them for the calculations. Um, there's, there's there's other small complications to do with the fact that technically the flat isn't actually mine. It belongs to the family trust, which my older sister runs, and things mm-hmm. like that. But um, I'm getting on okay with my older sister at um, and stuff like that. So um, I went to Madrid last weekend, not this weekend, but the one before which was amazing. And I slightly felt like going back. And it was funny. There was not a community mm-hmm. about digital nomads, but, um, but I do like it here. Um, and, you know, it takes, it's taken me a while to get back into the swing of things. Here. So, yeah, I mean, I think what I ought to do is start learning to concentrate on my writing, on, on, on making films and stuff like that, on making bits of content, but also possibly, yeah, just learning things and, you know, working out where I can put my skills, where I can be helpful to, um, mm. you know, basically looking at freelance websites and applying for jobs as well. Because um, mm-hmm. now I feel like it's it's the right time for me to do that. Um, so even though on the surface there's that pessimism and everything like that, the fact is that on my side, from where I am, even though I've had that news, things are actually okay. I've got to learn to separate mm. that news about that, which could have come any time you know, and it could have been, it could have been bad to separate that from my own well-being and my own ability to, you know, just operate, basically. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting um, outlook. I mean, I, 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 I mean, move, being able, having the option to move somewhere warm <laughs> at the end of the Swedish winter uh, although I've spent most of the winter in the UK I um you know I must say that's uh I'm looking forward <laughs> to spring I must say but yeah I mean it, it's um uh, I, I don't know Ranjan I'm 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 just so fucking tired yeah and you know just um yeah yeah you were really you were really going for it i mean i say this to you as someone who is not roger you know uh you know i did kind of mention it i think the last time i saw you we probably went for that lebanese um and uh, but oh, i do no, I mean, I'm a good shot and all the rest of it and and um for now, I've failed. I mean, there's no two ways about it. There's there, there's nothing doing right now, um, yeah. and, and I'm tr- I, I, I'm waiting for a spark of inspiration as to what what the angle is, what it's possible to do, <clears throat> you know, within the general field. That, that um, and I, you know, I mean, I I. I, uh, I I'll just have to wait and see what 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 turns up. Um, but I, I was talking to the people who own 
the land on the deal I, I I pulled out on. Yes, they rang rang up to have a chat with me to sort of see, you know, what my reasons were. Yeah. So we had this long chat. And I, uh, you know, and I said to the guy, look, one thing I did consider was talking to um, the, the for rent, uh, uh, for profit social rent sector. I said, the only thing is with them is that I, I don't really want to do that. Our whole company's idea is to, you know, build affordable yeah. homes or yeah, sell it. for young people that want to buy rather than rent yeah uh, so um i i think people should have the option to rent and it makes perfect sense for us to work with people that want to rent out but in the non-profit sector because if someone's doing that for profit that isn't actually enhancing the chances of you know um uh, the, the the people that aspire to home home ownership, um, and it's, I mean, it's always a quagmire sort of to 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 get into that as a, you know, um, business. You mean that field? It, well, I. Uh, no, well, it kind of has a belief system or as a world view, really. I mean, it, it, it's it it's um, I mean, it's very generation. I'm not sure. You've you've spoken against it in front of me before. I know that it's not what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to an architect two years ago. Now he he's based in Estonia. He's some professor of architecture guy that that I've been dealing with, and. Um, He's much younger than me. He's worked in London, all the rest of it. I mean, I say he's much younger than me. He's probably, well, he is much younger than me. I'm 58. I think he's probably in his early 40s. So that's, he's quite a lot younger than me. Um, but also he's from Estonia, not from the UK. And uh, when I had this conversation with him, he was sort of saying it was totally alien to him that I felt it was a good idea for young people who want to own their own place. So yeah, um, if he'd been German, I I I, I could have understand it slightly more because owner occupier occupation actually in former Eastern Bloc countries is is actually quite high still. Is it's higher than the average, whereas in Germany it's lower than the average across the the EU. Yeah. Um, but this. I mean, it's quite worrying. It's this this sort of uh, I mean, it's almost a WF. You'll own nothing and be happy kind of thing. Um, uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I. I again, though, it comes back to my point about feeling as. disillusioned as, uh, as 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 i have been feeling about where is the political pressure coming on uh for people to work harder at having peace rather than having wars uh where, where, when the dominant orthodoxy is um it's actually buying into this whole idea that that you know supporting um the ukrainian government is basically you know for your own benefit for democracy and fighting tyranny right um and that any other view apart from that is highly suspect and and and, and almost almost treasonous and to be able to sell that as successfully as it seems to, you know, it, 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 in that cohort of people that actually count. Now, in my customer base, and so this is a separate, it's a similar point on a complete, similar point about a completely separate topic. And talking to this guy in Estonia, um, within young younger people more broadly in the UK I mean obviously I've got my nieces and nephews and so you, you know I get to talk to to some young people but you know I don't um and uh 
but I wouldn't say that I I really know, even anecdotally, what young people really want. So that again, that's another that you know I I I make the assumption that that um, uh, they will eventually come to the idea that actually buying your own home is actually quite a good thing to do um but i i'm, I'm beginning I'm, is it a given no i mean I, I that this is the other thing is is that um i had a long chat with this friend of mine which we, we, um this is the beginning of last week which is what really just swung my mind in terms of ukraine kind of thinking blimey you know Here's, here's someone I know to be a good person, a caring person with their heart in the right place, but um, they, they uh, um, with a, but with a deeply orthodox view based on, you know, a number of the key issues of our time, which, which, which I, you know, which, which I simply just don't sign up to those ideas. Um, you know, I, I uh, but I had to confront the idea and, and well, it's higher than the probability, confront the fact that um, in, I, I would have said, most social settings with the broadest possible um, selection of my own um, group of friends or whatever, um, I think in most of the things we were talking about, if they were put to a vote, the vote would go against my view and that's that is i think um the problem that that we face in 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 changing the whole pressure dynamic on the house of commons actually pulling itself together and and, and to have the opposition scrutinizing the government uh, regardless of who's on what side the opposition should scrutinize the government and challenge it it shouldn't be a rubber stamp um, can I, can I, are you developing um, more points, bigger points that me speaking is going to get in the way? Because no, not at all. Yeah, because um, I've got sort of space, and um, I'm looking at some of the books that I've got. I picked, I picked quite a few up yesterday, but um, I remember years ago picking up a copy, first edition, 1940. John Maynard Keynes, How to Pay for the War. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a quote at the beginning, which is, I think it's almost from the Guild of Paper People. You know, it's mm -hmm. always, it's, it may as well be the Guild of Pamphleteers. It's not, but it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it's, it's a warning. It basically says, listen, every so often in life, your betters tell you what's going on. <laughs> it's not a bit like that. And then and um, and the thing is that, you know, a lot of you uh, won't get to read or hear someone read this warning to you. So I urge you, um, and this is from the 18th century, I urge you, pick, you know, pick up this pamphlet. We've made it a farthing. We've made it as cheap as we can. Mm. Pick it up or listen to someone reading this out. Um, I don't know what then is in that pamphlet, but they start off like that. He puts that at the beginning. And in the preface, and again, this is how to pay for the war. And I was thinking, well, you know, you know, did somebody do a how to pay for COVID? And did someone do a how to pay for, you know, whatever you want to call the Ukraine thing? Mm. Um, and he basically says, and again, he's a civil servant, right? He's a treasury guy. And he basically, as well as whatever else, and he comes in and he says, um, um, I've written three articles in the Times, one about savings, um, another one about something else. And it was is basically all about having a society in which people are supposedly following their liberal individual choices uh, and encouraging the society to start saving, but also recognising the need for rationing and for all of this to be coordinated in order to make sure that 100% of the country's effort can go into the war effort um, and not anything else. But it's kind of, you know, it's a pamphlet extended 
that seems to be designed to get people on side and spread the word, right. which is, you know, we need to have rationing. We need to have all of this stuff, you know, savings. It's a war, you know, to stop uh, Hitler and stuff like that. But what was also interesting for me, because I've been seeing I'm, in Madrid, they said prices were rising for food and that the margins mm -hmm. are getting thinner. And over here, they're saying that um, stocks are low on food. So I've been able to get tomatoes because I go to Aldi and they've got tomatoes. Uh, you know, it's no big deal, but there are sort of less vegetables in, you know, in, in certain shops. Um, so it was interesting for me combining what was the, the preface of how to pay for the war, which is getting everybody ready for that kind of thing and trying to argue psychologically. He makes Pavlov references to basically get everyone on side. That's what it's all about. And then um, comparing that with the beginning of economic consequences of the piece, where the preface at the end of it, he says, listen, we've completely fucked this up with reparations and the way we're treating Germany. And as a result, all that's going to happen is we're going to have another fucking war. Um, but we must remember that at the end of it, the good thing is we will be able to have a, and then he says in capital letters, new world order. Um, wow. Well, yeah. um, it was interesting to see him do that preface you know, 18, 20 years later, uh, saying, OK, it's time. Everybody get on board. So it feels very great reset. Well, yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like something like, you know, the the tag new world order nwo well it means uh, th that's something that means different things to different people i mean I, um logically if you've got a world and you've got a whole bunch of people living in different parts of a world and they're in touch with each other right and how their relations fall into place right whatever that relationship between these different groups of people well what would you call it well calling it a world order wouldn't be controversial would it right yeah. so um and then when you sort of say right well you've got to have a dynamic between these different groupings in the world um the world order as it stands is X. Um, may, may, maybe we, maybe it would work better if we did it a different way. What should we call it? Well, you, you would call it, you know, a proposed world order. And if it came to pass, you'd call it a new world order, wouldn't you? So on, on the face of it, those are just words. You know, it, it's a, a description of a state of affairs, right? But Cain sort of saying, you know, the new world order would be this when he wrote that. Right. Um, I suspect that even the most dedicated of John Birch's at the time wouldn't really have riled against it quite so much, because I think it means something completely different now to probably when he wrote it. And it's only with hindsight now that people are sort of saying, ah, you know, this is this great long term plan. And it's it's part of the that's part of the problem of how polarized people get in terms of um, rather than. Uh, sort of saying, right, um, what is the state of affairs? What sets of policies has led us to this state of affairs? That we could have d done differently to perhaps be in a better a, a better place, right? And I, now, I mean, I believe in diplomacy, and I think diplomacy is way, way, way superior to to war, right? Um, for a host of different reasons. Um, uh, uh, But you can't have diplomacy without without an appreciation of what the different view without a discussion. I mean, you know, I mean that goes without saying, can't you? you know, so so um, I, the, 
how polarized uh, things have got. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I it, it. I mean, I don't. Are more people having more sensible conversations? I had a, com I had a sensible conversation with my friend last week. He got quite angry at times. I didn't. Um, I, I, you know, I tried to keep it as good humoured as possible. Um, but I, you know, I've certainly thought a lot about it since. But um, I. I, I I really do think that that um, the problem for all of us um, who find ourselves on different sides of um, the discussion on <clears throat> whether peace is superior to war in Ukraine, <coughs> even at this point, um, what, What's the biggest obstacle to having those sensible conversations? I, I said I, I saw a very good meme the other day, and it was a revolver with NATO spelt on it, you know, spelt backwards, with a newspaper wrapped around the, 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 the around the barrel of this revolver, and it was it was a Spanish one, and and it was the newspaper wrapped around the end of the gun was silencio, silencer. Which I thought was very, very oh, yeah, good. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot because the Spanish spell NATO, OTAN. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, I, and this is the. Almost, it's almost like Cluedo, isn't it? It was Colonel Mustard in the library with the yeah. silence. <laughs> yeah. So as I say, I mean, I'm, 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 I am very tired, and I, I, I can't wait for the spring because then hopefully, I mean, I'm feeling 100 percent better than I was the week before last. I bet you are absolutely knackered, um, but I, you know, I, I, I think my cough and cold has got more to do with actually having got really quite run down from you know um, being well, flat out for so long. I remember, I remember one day you were talking about Web3 and the Four Musketeers. And around then, so this must have been um, coming up for September 2019. I think it was around then. One day, you know, you, you said, actually, you know what? I've got something to tell you. And it reminded me of one of those Greek philosophers. I can't remember who it is, which one it is. But you basically just said, oh, yeah, well, I mean, from an intellectual perspective, some of the ideas I've been having, the only way in which I'm going to be able to uh, know whether or not I'm right about them is if I get back into business. Um, I think that was three and a half years ago. Uh, I mean, it might have been 2018, but I think it was 2019. And um, <coughs> so you've been waiting, essentially, you know, like in direct form, I think since about halfway through 2019, you've been, you know, like overtly mm -hmm. doing research with that purpose. Um, and getting on with it so that's a long time to be doing a campaign well well I mean, it, it, I mean i haven't finished yet i'm just you know basically uh regrouping um but it's Can you hear a funny noise? Yeah, funny I, I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was going to be easy, but also at the same time, I, 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 I don't think I had any idea it would be as hard as it has been. Um, you know, I mean, it, I, I, it, it must be. Obviously, I'm not young anymore, but, but I, 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 I do feel for the young people because the. It's, well, it's, it, it's just so. It, I mean, to me, looking forward now, it's it's kind of bleak, um, and I mean, this is something I agree with my friend on. You know, the the degree of student debt piled on people. You know, the just the, you know, it, it's what is there to aim for? 
and and it seems to me that you know the best you can aim for is is to make sure that you're that that, that you're as conforming as possible uh and and and, and um receive the appropriate degree of patronage through that conformity well, um, fuck, I, have I, mean, another, I have another quick anecdote for you uh on saturday uh i was at pret a manger with a mate meeting a mate um, and there was somebody sitting next to him who was reading a copy of the new letter review. Mm. Uh, blonde hair, probably 10, 15 years younger than me. Uh, guy. Um, so at some point I said to him, do you subscribe to that? Because I think it was the November 22 uh, edition. Uh, and I think he said, no, I sometimes read the London Review of Books. So we started talking about politics a little bit. I mean, he was obviously must be coming from the left a bit. Um, and it turns out that he is a councillor for the Labour Party, uh, for the London, uh, for the city of Westminster, uh, Pimlico Borough, um, and told me that he was a civil servant at the DWP, and he never particularly wanted to be a councillor, but he looked at the other people who were running, and he was the chair of the CLP, and uh, he'd come in under Corbyn, and that's why he joined the party and stuff, and uh, having been a Green before, and he basically said, actually, you know, if somebody else was going to do a better job, I would let them. But I think I've had just as good a chance of doing a good job as the other people running. So he ran and he became a councillor. Um, he told me that he's not allowed to take a proper council, like like become head of the council, or any, mm. have an actual full-on job, because that would go against his um, work as a civil servant. You know, he would lose his job as a civil servant if he did that. But um, what he said was that he he did live in the borough, he doesn't approve of people not living in the borough where they're a councillor, but he was offered something where he was able to, um, basically he's living in Maidenvale because he was offered something which is for people whose wage is in between. It's like lower rent, you can't buy mm -hmm. it, but it's in between that and then you eventually yeah, get on. In, intermediate social or whatever they call it. Yeah, yeah, he called it that, yeah. I mean, he didn't sound like he approved, but at the same time, he didn't sound like he had much choice as far as he was concerned. Um, but yeah, that was an interesting example of somebody who is in the category that you kind of talked about to me just now. He was pro-arming Ukraine, by the way, but um, despite reading the New Left Review. Um, and um, yeah, so that was an example of someone. Nice enough chat. Um, but yeah, mm. I think. Yeah, I, I could say, I mean, I... I, I I mean, everybody has their reasons and their views, and and, and uh, I did you watch the unheard debate where there was Constantine Kisson on one side and Peter Hitchens on the other uh, about no, Ukraine? Who is, who, is, who is Constantine Kisson, and what was the subject? He's trigonometry. He, he's the guy, oh, okay. Russian comedian. Yeah. Okay. His um, and it was quite interesting watching that because uh, people should discuss things and it's not a question of even thinking you're going to persuade the other person to agree with you it's not it's, it's this it's understanding the differences of opinion you have and why you have them that's that's the way to avoid conflict well, that's you what know, we do. Like, it's agree to agree we used to do it quite often <laughs> um, yeah, and that's what we do pardon that's what we do that's not coming out i'm saying that is what we do you know you might not agree with me on everything and i might not agree with you on everything but we do listen to each other we do agree on a lot but you know that's what we do yeah. that's good yeah, I mean, I, I and you know, maybe if a bit more of that had been going on, there wouldn't be so many dead people in Ukraine right now, or in Syria, or in Libya, or in Iraq. You know, it goes. I, I it, people sort of say, oh, it's the first deadly war in Europe for so long, or whatever. Well, actually. You know, in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, I mean, the, the, you know, another NATO war um, that 
I mean, that's ever so close to Italy. I mean, Italy was in Europe last time yeah. I looked. Yeah, in fact, Ukraine, yeah, Ukraine is further away than that. So this whole idea, um, it, it, apart from the fact it's not true, um, but um, that, that this is the first, you know, somehow that the EU is responsible for the fact there weren't any wars and, and so is NATO. Uh, it just isn't true. Yeah, um, oh my God, I get all that. I, I mean, I don't have Brexit conversations very often, but, you know, so there's people who, you know, I've definitely put it on the side for ages. But as we've got back into contact with each other, for whatever reason, I've, you know, I've been told that I'm a right wing troll, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And but the line it sounds so funny, right, you know, it, 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 I mean, that is so funny that someone would call you right wing. <laughs> I, 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 what makes it even more ironic is I think that you probably have a a greater sympathy with the idea of there even being a left and right than I do. And if someone called me left or right, they probably have a better point in, in terms of try, calling me right wing, even though I I would say they're wrong. But I would actually say, I don't know, what, you know, I know what you're on about, but I don't believe in left and right. I, I just don't think it's a thing. Or it certainly shouldn't be a thing. If, if people really thought about it, they'd get away from that. Uh, it's a little bit like New World Order. It means uh, it means it means something that it didn't really used to mean. I, you know, and 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 the label apply. You know, applying right wing to left wing views and left wing to right wing views. It, it's kind of become inverted completely completely i love it i mean i love being told off now by people who you know i kind of just think oh my god it's just absolutely amazing you know but when i say i love it i don't go looking for it because it's too easy one of my friends on twitter he trolls people and every time he sees someone who might be described as far right or anything like that he always he always says to them oh you know poor little lefty like that um, <laughs> but, but when it comes down to it he can explain that those people are all pro nhs they're all pro this they're all pro that they've you know they've absorbed the values of the country and so there's elements of you know collective uh in that this is what it means to be in a country isn't it but yeah, yeah. i would just like to see people talking about it more and drilling down rather than you know um well you're one of those well you're one of those i don't like you then i'm not going to talk to you anymore that that that's and 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 that level of discourse got ramped up beyond any uh oh, yeah, during the brexit thing so and and and, and now again it renewed it's the same thing um the, nobody's it you kind of pick your side and then you get out your bumper stickers you don't yeah, I, was gonna say, yeah, I was gonna say you've got acrimony um which uh a, a, acrimony due to acronyms you know i'm just gonna acronym you and yeah. uh, we can have a fight you know what you said about the clack I'm just going to be, you are a woke or a BME or a Ramona or a Brexiteer. You know, you're just a whatever. It's just like fucking label yeah. swapping and at the end it all nets out. I, I, I genuinely do believe that uh, people... Well, do I believe that people have a deeper understanding of a lot of things? I do I'd like to. Th I'd like to think they care more about these things to give them a bit more, a, a bit more of an airing, a bit more discussion. You know, this this open shut. You're not on my side, therefore you're obviously wrong. I'm. I'm not going to listen to you. You just must go away. Um, and you uh, you see that on so many arguments that are so polarized. So I'm not saying it's, you know, it, it's people who are for brexit or people who are against brexit i i see everybody doing it and i 
Roger, I a, 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 a well-known Remainer, uh, that I DM'd and I called him and he said, oh yeah, you know, maybe we could look at some, because I was looking at the BBC Richard Sharp story and the, and the loan with Boris and all that stuff. And he said, oh yeah, you know, maybe we could do some stuff. But um, at one point, he looked at my timeline. I sent him something. He looked at my timeline and he came back to me and he said, I can see that you've retweeted Asim Malhotra, the doctor, and you've mm-hmm. retweeted something to do with Max Blumenthal. Uh, therefore, uh, we won't be able to work together. And then he said, you know, I hope you understand. And I so I, I came back and I said, I didn't say I thought we were friends, but I said, mm-hmm. you know, I consider I consider you a friend, actually, you know, you know, than a colleague or whatever. And um, and he basically then said that on both counts, you know, with the doctor warning about the vaccine and uh-huh. uh, I can't remember what um, what Max Boomson was talking about. But he said on both counts, it counted as complicity in a form of biological warfare that's what he told me um and i remember just thinking fucking hell i didn't think that's what i was doing and i said you know look at my timeline it's got loads of stuff on it but um yeah but that's an example of you know where where somebody just says i'm right you're wrong i'm busy go away Uh, yeah we have a war on (laughs) which i don't think You know, I don't want to think we have a war on. I just want to say, I've got my view. Can I put it out? Or can I share a good point someone made? Well, uh, there's a war in Ukraine, obviously. Um, This this, this whole idea of we're in World War Three and it's a biological, all of that stuff about the... um, uh, The injections... Oh, yeah, because now that now they're trying to say that China, that, that now the Wall Street Journal is pushing the leak, the lab leak. They're pushing it again. Well, I, I mean, you know, David made his documentary for Channel 4 about that. And I, yeah, I, I mean, he got paid to make a documentary. That's the one he made. It was with the lawyers a lot and all the rest of it came out of the thing. I mean, I, um, whether David's right or wrong, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I do know that that documentary will reflect his honest, yeah. the honest out of his inquiries. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the chance of it being right are quite high, I would personally say, yeah. um, that, that based on the fact that I, you know, uh, I don't think he went to make a documentary with a foregone conclusion because sure. that's not the it's not the sort of person he is he wouldn't do that so yeah. this is the funny thing ranjan because the other thing is climate change and all of this stuff channel four made the documentary the great global warming swindle and you know they asked david to make that and he said no because it went against his you know mm. he, he had no interest in making that documentary yeah. because he happened to have you know he, he believed that and had no interest in making yeah. a polemic yeah. <coughs> on that subject. And again, I mean, it's a, a, a similar reason to why I think that, you know, with the lab leak thing, you know, I, I, I yeah, I mean, it was. It, uh, Yeah, there are honest people in the world and there are honest people in the media and, and you know, um, the honest people get less work these days. That's, you know, that's that, that, that that's the, that's a problem, I think. Well, you know, what? Uh, on that, on that, uh, I have been thinking because I'm you know, not currently working, etc. But, you know, quite up for it. Um, I have been thinking, shit, you know, I've got to do more blogging, do more, you know, just put more stuff out. Um, essentially just to make people laugh you know I don't I don't mean you know as a full-on comedian because I'm a bit dry but um, you know I just want to put stuff out and and see what happens Um, yeah I mean I I I mean that's it's more your line of country than the mine I you know I I, uh, yeah I mean, I, I think I, I, it's uh, yeah. it's easier to make money with a spade than a pen, mate. 
<laughs> <laughs> said the property developer to the to the man of letters. <laughs> Have you seen on, on TikTok the other day? I was flicking through, and um, some great Trump videos. I mean, just I mean, I, when I say some great, I mean I'm only talking about two. But I mean, I think he must have been at some sort of a you know you know rally a couple of days ago or this week and stuff like that. And then also he was interviewed, I think, at the same place. And the way he said it. Uh, I, I mean, I assume it's from now. He basically just said Gaddafi, uh, Saddam Hussein. I can't remember who else he said, but he basically said these were not nice people. They were not nice people. But look at what the fuck has happened to those places. You know, and he basically just said, you know, leveled. All these places are leveled. And it's just really yeah. interesting remembering that he's a property developer, that, you know, he puts buildings up and he's talking, you know, he wasn't, you know, he was just saying, he never mentioned that he's a property developer, but he basically just says, there's, you know, all you can see is the floor in these places. They're fucking crumbled. And he was talking about that in Ukraine. And the way he just said, I would never have allowed that shit to happen. So I remember, I remember just thinking, we need him back. <laughs> it's quite funny because I would never have said that in the first place. But, um, but you know, you, you, you helped me understand that there is such a thing as business as usual. And he got in the way of that. And now we've gone back to business as usual. But I think everybody knew that there was, well, not everybody, people, I spoke to an American guy at the time, people knew that Biden coming in was going to lead to war. But I don't know, you know, like war's not nice. This isn't nice. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's tragic. It really is. Um, but it's, It's not going to get any less tragic by people not talking about it. I guess that's that that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it. And the problem is that that. Um, the orthodox mainstream political view. Remains the dominant one in the circles which have any chance of having any any influence whatsoever um so the so yeah the the degree of self-interest in that it, it, it is is again a really sad part of um i think i've mentioned before the the melt fund website that that um robin smith did in fact i haven't spoken to robin i i, I must get in touch with him at some point uh he, he worked with dr Adrian wrigley and the fiscal reform group um so this is the taxation and the money system and all that right well, the Melt Fund was a, a parody of the property market, which was hilarious. He took it down. It's still on the way back machine. Um, but basically, running through it was this, um, the whole idea that the system which is impoverishing every, everybody else is still enriching the group the influential group and so it's a variation on the th theme about you know no man will see um will see the alternative argument as long as his salary depends on not seeing it you know that that yeah. that that idea um and how far do things have to go before people actually think well i i no, you know that that's it. That's enough now. I I I, I really can't go with this anymore. Um, but it's the the gradual process by which fascism overtakes a kind of a the the group psychology, as it were. Um, you know, we've been there before. Not just in Nazi Germany. You know, you've got you had Mao in China and the Cultural Revolution. You had Cambodia um, and a similar process. I mean, I don't 
how far gone are we in the United Kingdom in that process? You know, how how, how degraded did our capacity to listen to each other become as a result of the bun fight over Brexit? I mean, it went on for a long time and it just, um, it's been incredibly successful in stopping people talking to each other about anything. Well, right now, um, the, the whole... I, mean, I had a look at, had a quick look at the sun, as in I didn't read it. I just had a quick look at it, had a quick look at, I didn't even look at the times because obviously it's the same principles as before. But I think the idea appears to be that, um, you know, goods can come in and out of Northern Ireland and the onus is supposedly, they're saying on the surface, that the onus is on the DUP when they come in power to be able to say, we don't want these regulations to apply to us from Europe. But it's still, it's still, I think the underlying is that European regulations will apply in uh, in Northern Ireland, unless the DUP say they don't. I don't know what the knock-on effect then becomes to England, if England can can uh, can diverge much more. But, um, and so, and these happen, like when I was talking about it with Ron, it's the idea of blanket checks versus spot checks. So clearly it's spot checks. They, they divide it into green and red goods, lanes. Um, and, you know, so some lanes that basically there's no big deal, so they're just going to let everything through. So that's no checks. And then I think probably sp spot checks, for, you know, other stuff that might be more controversial. But um, it, does, it looks like such a fudge, it, you know, but by bringing the king in and all of this stuff and politicising it before it's even been voted for. And so you can just see that they're really gambling. And, you know, on finance TV earlier on today, they were saying, you know, two hours is a long time in British politics. No one seems to have come out against it properly. Um, but so in that sense, you know, the DP are pissed off. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it is, can this ever be closed, you know, as a topic? Um that's another question. You know, you've got the principle itself and then you've got the practicality of just closing it. It's quite funny. They are opposed. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't read any of that stuff. Sure. Um, no, no, that's why I, I said it like that. Just that's, I, that's all I, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think I am going to read it, to be honest, either. I mean, I... I um, I mean, I'm not sure I've got better things to do with my time. <laughs> I Can probably I say, haven't. You know, but... <laughs> you, know, you know how you said to me that, you know, blogging is more my terrain than yours, right? Obviously, you blog way more than I do, even when you're not blogging. And and uh, well, one of the many things I admire about your, your blogs is the way you put the words together in the title. I just can't stop laughing. I mean, in today's one, I think you said uh, sort of teeth grindingly something, something. Um so one of the things I have to say about if you look at because it's a meme war. So the meme that came out for yesterday, um, you know, when they, they try to put a list of things, it's just such a load of bollocks. But one of the things uh, is they start talking about sausages. Right. They right. Actually put sausages in the list of achievements that Rishi Sunak has come up with. And if you don't put something about the sizzle, not the sausage in, uh, you know, as a salesperson, if you don't talk about selling the sizzle, not the sausage uh -huh. in your next thing, I, I I'll be surprised. Um, <laughs> just because they fucking put sausage on the list. Um, you know, like coming here, coming over here, relabeling our sausages, you know, this type of thing. And also, you know, the sausage factory, etc. I mean, you know, it's a metaphorical gold mine. But, um, That's really in this communique about this supposed New Deal. With, with in the, the, yeah, the on Twitter, plating. on Twitter. Yeah, if you look at the list, you know, it's 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 like it's the only product that seems to be on the list. You know, they say medicines, but that that's generic. But it actually said sausages. You know, we I don't know what it says, but some sort of freedom for sausages. But I don't know what exactly. Whatever it was, our sausages can travel around. Goodness me. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know. I think I'm just all round washed out at the moment, mate. I I just yeah, just don't. I I think I just need to take a break, really. It, it, yeah, who who knows? So what's the protocol then? Do I stay out of your way for a bit, or no? It's all I'm fine. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not depressed or anything like that. I'm just apps. I'm I'm knackered and and just sort of thinking. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've, obviously I've got a, from a business perspective. I'm I'm just I'm not forcing the thinking on it because there's not really any point. There's no fucking hurry. Um. Uh. And it's what I've identified as a problem. It, well, okay. it may not be a problem if, if 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 I've got my the idea that I have a a customer constituency of young people that want to be owner occupiers that are pissed off because the prospects of buying and long term yeah. rent the higher rents is something which has somehow become an acceptable part of the mix for young people um and I'm, i've always been alive to that possibility especially after i spoke to that architect i was telling you about um I, you see you know and i, and I, I mean i there are contexts in which I could see that would become a valid, in my opinion, would be the rational, valid choice, as it were. Um, but that, that, it, that, that, for that to become the case, you'd have to change quite a lot of the surrounding context. In you know. Um, yeah, the idea that we're headed into this neo feudalism, I, 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 I do think that's a thing. I, I, I do think that the the chinless wonders, um, who are implementing a plan that they wouldn't have come up all by themselves, you know. So the the evil genius is dead and gone. I would say. So. You know, I, I don't think Bill Gates or George Soros or um, Richard Branson or um, I don't know a whole host of other people that you'd kind of hold up as being um, potentially, you know, the the blow fell stroke in the cat, you know, um, uh, Klaus Schwab, whatever. I, I don't I don't think that they or their talking heads like uh what's he called the um Yovari, the you know the yeah 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 Yoval, whatever yeah, he's yeah. called i know who you mean uh the yeah. guy the transhumanist guy yeah homo yeah. sapiens or De homo deus that type of thing yeah sapiens or yeah. yeah so i mean i don't i don't think that these are the bond villain that retire to their sort of volcano and stroke their cat. So I, I, I don't think that that individual, that group of individuals, I don't think they're any longer with us. Maybe they died with David Rockefeller. Um, and, and even in his case, uh, clearly it was his. Um, was John D. Rockefeller his grandfather, David Rockefeller? It was, I'm not sure if it was his father or his grandfather, but mm. the the great family fortunes from the industrial revolution, which is, you know, um, they, they were made in the late 19th century through the 20, you know, partly through this, you know, up to the second world war or whatever. The current crop of evil geniuses have, have basically been put there by finance capital. So Bill Gates's fortune is not a real fortune in the sense that, you know, he 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 uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, they're all crony capitalists. They're pretending to be industrial capitalists of some sort, but they're not. They're, they're basically uh, 
you know, second or third generations down from the class of evil geniuses that figured this all out, as it were. Um, so, but of course, they, they didn't invent feudalism or whatever. Or, or well, by some people's don't, they will sort of say this has been going on for millennia or whatever. Um, I personally, I I think it's really the, the further far back you go, the harder it is. Um, but, but do you, do you think I, I feudalism is just a big accident? No, no, I don't. But what I do think is that the people trying to implement it are idiots and they're going to fail, right? But the degree of failure could end with quite a lot of death and destruction simply because they are such fucking idiots. Um, so. So my argument is that um, the group of evil geniuses, maybe that set up the Federal Reserve, the you know, the founding of the Bank of England, the uh, Bank of Amsterdam, things like the East India Company, uh, you know, British colonialism. Uh, a lot of these very elitist um, and, you know, and, and, and racist, uh, supremacist kind of things, right? Uh, they, they kind of, they grew up through the modern age in, you know, with industrial production and stuff like that. And <sighs> what <sighs> what I think people talking to each other will achieve is the it's the rehumanization not only of each other but also of the villains so if you see klaus schwab as this bond villain or as, as some sort of extra human you know john kerry or al gore or prince charles or you know um this idea that they're otherworldly, they're not like us, they're, they're you know, um, and they're so not like us, they're just so much cleverer, they've all this stuff. It's not true, they're human, right? Um, and and, and um, uh, they're also way more limited in their, um, their capabilities than the the group of people that kind of put them in the position that they're in so you know my argument is that that um the idea that we're ruled by uh, uh, an irresistible force of you know great evil and whatever kind of plays into their hands i think it, I, I i do think it's giving them too much credit you know like i say i i i think um uh at best don't don't paint them any cleverer than people you meet in your daily life or whatever you know, you know, yeah. but, but I, I mean, I go a step further than that. Personally, I think they're fucking idiots, um, but that probably just makes me an even bigger idiot than they are. But, you know, that, that makes me happy. So I'm happy with that. Sounds but, like but I recommend that anyone else put, puts, puts, I certainly wouldn't put any of them on a pedestal, which is something that tends to happen. So I, I found it deeply offensive seeing Bill Gates meeting Keir Starmer and Sunak. And, and that when Grant Shapps, I, I mean, you, know. you just know that he went home, watched that video of himself and had a wank, don't you? You just know. He... <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the David Lanny photo? William sent me uh, the David Lanny photo. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> David Lally yeah. photo, and they're they're looking very close to each other. I mean, it's it's awful. It is, and uh, uh, it, like we're streeting. I, oh, who the fuck is that guy? Where is he coming from? I. I told you. I told you. I told you that I've I've bumped into Quentin Letts a few times as a result of working with William, um, and uh, I never told you this. So you know, he used to write for the Daily Mail, and he's now at the Times sketch writer, um, mm-hmm. and he is so funny. I mean, he's upset a lot of people. Sometimes people have even called him racist and stuff like that. He, I mean, he certainly isn't. You know, like he he's very, very, very good with me um, and with William. Uh, but um, I remember one of the first times. Because basically, Helena used to read the mail, so I'd get it every day. Perfect yeah. excuse. And um, she loved Quentin Letts once, because he's the sketch writer. So once he was at a select committee, because uh, Streeting was on the Treasury Select Committee. And because Quentin Letts is a Christian, um, you know, every so often he thinks it's OK to advocate what some might regard as a homophobic position. Um, but the thing is that, you know, he'll do it in a way that is funny. So basically, what did he do? He referred to uh, West Streeting and he referred to his Dame Twanky eyebrows. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, I can't remember what he did after that, but whatever it was, it was very, very, very funny. Um, you know, he doesn't use many words. It was West Streeting gay. Yes. Uh, very camp. Um, is he? Well, is is yeah. he just camp or is he a, is he a full on shirt lifter? No, I mean, he. he, he <laughs> He is camp, um, but you know it's very. In, in you know, he's not. Yeah, well, really. He's not out or anything in particular. He is. He is. Or... He is. He is. He is. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, he's open to gay. Yeah. Um, oh, he is. Okay, right. Yeah. 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 But um, one of the things that's um, that uh, the, what was that? I, I, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that. So I mean. He, right. You say he's camp. He doesn't mince very much, does he? He's not a mincing sort of camp. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but um, there you go. Um, but one of the things that was really funny was when I actually met Quentin Letts for the first time, I think it was at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. And, um, I, you know, so I introduced myself and I said, you know, massive fan of your work. Don't agree with you on anything. Massive fan of your work. Um, and and so I said to him, you know, my favourite thing that he had done, which was about um, West Streeting's eyebrows. And as I, was right. talking to him, as I was talking to him, I looked at him and I said, oh, my God, Mr. Letts, your eyebrows are worse than West Streeting's. <laughs> um, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And he, he grinned. And I said, look, we must do a selfie. And we did. But um, yeah, I, he's, he's brilliant. I was in I was in um, I was in the media select committee. This was hilarious. Damien Green, who got done for watching porn. He yeah. was um, he's the, he was the chair of the select committee and uh, for media and uh, online harms. And he was grilling um, Richard Sharp. Uh, and I sat at the back. And on my right, there was Quentin Letts, the other sketch writer from The Times, the one from The Telegraph. Anyway, Letts gave me a nice nod as he walked past. It was quite funny just seeing him there. And um, and when I left, um, bu- 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 Sharp, had, had, he had hired a, a crisis communications guy called Andrew Garfield, who used to be quite a big um, financial uh, journalist. And I go up to them afterwards obviously both jewish they he's been through i i didn't think about this but he's just been grilled you know like that was high pressure and so really the only people in there are geeks so i go up to them and i go oh hiya and mr garfield is so friendly he goes oh hello who are you and obviously me being me i didn't want to lie i said well i'm, I'm you know i'm just a, i said i'm just a blogger i'm not on your side <laughs> and uh Richard Sharp looked at me, looked at Andrew Garfield, who's probably paying a lot of money. And he said, I'm afraid I can't participate in this conversation. And he ran downstairs. Um, and then Garfield just gave me the official narrative. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, this is, you know, I do like living in a country where I'm able to do that. But um, yeah. at the same time, I, I'm with you. You know, these, these, I didn't feel that I was in the company of you know, titans of capitalism. 
even though these guys are, you know, they, you know, they'd be regarded as pretty high up in that Sharp ran investment banking for Goldman Sachs, blah blah blah. Um, but you know, I think they lose it. Well, the, this is the same Sharp that's in charge of the BBC now. Is that the same yeah. guy? Yeah. And um, I was discussing it with with uh, Ron. It turns out that his dad was in charge of cable and wireless, and before that, he was in charge of Monsanto. Uh, for yeah. Europe. Um, mm. And all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's a very funny. I mean, there, there, there's a the the degree of nepotism is just massive now, uh, and and it was new lit Labour kind of took on the mantle of that. You know, I mean, mm. there were really peerages in 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 in, in, uh, in the House of Lords. I've got fuck all on 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 the sort of the new Labour political dynasties. Um, I mean, I, I you know I guess they've had Tory dynasties for a long time, but the fact that they now sort of um, uh, proliferate on both sides of the House of Commons is just really bad news. I mean, it's it's um, it's kind of like a political syncretism, really. That yeah, I mean, from a distance, that, I suppose, because I, I was I was reading this book about museums <laughs> and they quoted Earl Spencer uh, and they said he was in the House of Lords. But this book was written in 94. So I reckon he's one of the people that was kicked out. Um, I so saw they kicked, a quote the other day about not going to the um, coronation. So sort of right. saying, oh, well, there's a coronet somewhere knocking about God knows where. But he obviously lost interest when, you know, when, when, yeah. when they got rid of the hereditary part of the lords you know right um, right yeah exactly so so it's interesting from a kind of revolution perspective the way in which they got rid of all of those hereditary peers but then afterwards there's so many lords now um and then the other thing is um when they when the highest court of the land used to be the house of lords and they shifted it to the supreme court very quietly around 2003 or five or something like that and nobody really understood it. and it wasn't until brexit that the papers said, by the way, what? it's such a strange argument, though, that, that somehow an elected second chamber should be any less corrupt than an elected first chamber. Yeah, but the, it, but the second uh, chamber, the second chamber isn't elected. It's selected. Uh, but that's that's what they're. That's what they're advocating for, ultimately, isn't it? I mean, the 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 second chamber in Europe, which is the re, the first chamber, obviously the commission. They're selected too, uh, and and that's the sort you know that's the sort of democracy we can all get behind, isn't it? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh boy, I mean, I'm talking to my friend. I mean, that's something we agreed on. I mean, I I sort of said, well, you know, if, if they got rid of the commission, went back to the EQ, and every country's had their own um, currency, their own central bank money issuing blah 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 I, I i would have less objection to what the eu claims to be it would have a greater claim to be what it says it is you know um if 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 if, 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 if it was back then um but it's it has changed um oh, what did i see the other day which which um oh i know what it was the after swine flu right the swine flu uh, pandemic 2003 right? yeah yeah the eu actually commissioned an inquiry into the corruption around buying vaccines and about all yeah. the hysteria Tally around flu. that there's a guy called dr wolfgang wolfdrag or whatever wolfdrag he, he, he was on that commission well he was one of the dissenting voices during all the covid19 stuff i, I um really and I, so, so th there was a Channel Four. Um, Channel Four did a, um, I think it was on UK Column yesterday. So they played this Channel Four segment after the, about this European Commission thing. Now on uh, 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 the EU inquiry, another inquiry that the EU did um, in the late nineties uh, was to do with um, to do with spying. And, and 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 political influence and stuff like this um and the guy that that, that uh, gave evidence on that oh now what's the guy's name again um oh uh, da, 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 da. 
the other thing that came to my head, sort of seeing this wolf drink thing, this this the, the EU inquiry. Um, oh, he's a Scottish journalist. That the, the ABC trials. Duncan Campbell. Duncan yeah. Campbell. Say say his name again. Duncan Campbell. You broke up. Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell. I'm st- what that Duncan broke up. Campbell. Duncan Campbell. Duncan, Duncan Campbell, yes, him. So and again, I mean, if you could get back to and that's not that long ago. I mean that's the late nineties. Um and then the early two thousands. So, you know what? It, it, it kind of all seems to have happened so quickly. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The lack of memory, isn't it? It's amnesia, yeah. isn't it? It's the it's the well, spreading of amnesia. You need to distribute amnesia, and then it doesn't matter. Well, the the, the thing is, the internet is is just perfect as, for a room one hundred and one type of thing, um, mm. because you know stuff disappears on the web really quite quickly. Yeah, I remember someone someone who I met in the early 2000s online uh, who, you know, was like into his media and stuff like that, told me, I can't remember when, probably three or four years ago, he said to me, yeah, the internet is easy to gatekeep now, whereas when we met, it wasn't. You know, yeah. it was much harder. You, yeah. you, know, you could find things easily. Um, yeah, and again, it's a monopoly thing. I mean, it, the, the, the concentration of 